เอ๋อหนังสือAll right, Gail, if we're ready, yep. 704, I think we're all here. There's a few members in the audience. Okay, so we should um, all go around and introduce ourselves for people in the audience, even though we do that every time. Mm -hmm. um, I'll begin, I'm Gail Lansky. I've been on the CDBG advisory committee. This is about my fourth go round and I'm actually in Canada. I'm not sure I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> hey, that's fine, you're here. Okay. I can't see who's next, so somebody just jump in. I can only see you, Nathaniel. All right, uh, which one's that? So I guess I go, I'm, I'm Nate Malloy. I'm a planner with the town, and I help staff the committee. I'm Rika Clement. <clears throat> I'm a relatively new member, just elected in June to a, a full term. I'm Becky Michaels. I'm also new. This is my first time going through this process, and I think June might also have been my, my start date. Uh, yeah. Lucas Hanscom, also new member. And I'm Nat Larson, the other Nathaniel on the committee. And um, I guess I've been through this process a few times. Okay, are there any announcements, um, Nate? Uh, I don't think so. I think the, um, you know, this is for everyone who's listening, you know, this is the 21 2021 block grant application process the committee has received proposals and has questions of applicants and tonight they're going to review and prioritize proposals and the application to the state is due by september 10th and the um there hasn't been any changes so you know a while, you know months ago the state had equivocated about deadlines and certain things but since they've announced the september 10th deadline in this process um nothing's changed so you know, I will say that they are trying to review these quickly and uh, make awards in January. And then the 22 round, usually the 22 round, you know, would start now and then applications would be due, you know, in February, but they may, I think they're gonna have the 22 round possibly follow the same schedule and not be due until September of next year or um, maybe in the summer of next year. So. You know, we'll, I'll let the committee and everyone know that more information is available, but I think they're thinking about switching the cycle around quite a bit. That changes everything, but you'll keep us a post, posted. Are we, are we ready to move on um, to reviewing and prioritizing the proposals, which you kind of already prioritized them for us. So <clears throat> you did the, the math and everything. Should I do the um, share that the ranking screen? That'd be great. I don't know how visible that is for everyone, if it's big enough or. Yeah. I don't know where the committee wants to start with the social services. Typically, we start with and uh, or the non-social service. Uh, yeah. Let's do so. Let's do the non-social service first. It's kind of easier because there are. Um, there aren't as many to consider, and it's right here on the top of our screens. So as you can see, Watson Farms came in um, four out of five. So does anybody want to discuss, or do you want to just roll with what we've got here? Any comments? I, I just had a quick question. Um, if uh, Because are all these, um, all the non-social service ones, they're blocks. So if you don't, if they're not fully funded, does that mean that they just don't sort of happen? Or I mean, it's really hard to partially fund a roof, right? Right. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think usually we have to build a budget up to 825. And so for non-social service, you, we usually have about, you know, 536,000. And we, we can go over the numbers um, once that's finalized. But yeah, for like the housing authority project and um, 
maybe Kellogg Ave, it's a pretty, you know, there's a, a detailed line item budget. And I think if you, if those were reduced by, I mean, I think a little bit might be okay, but by a lot, then I think the project okay. might shift. Okay. But there is some give and take as far as the actual totals to make the project actually happen. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, I think okay. like, for instance, Watson Farms, I think they had said, or what they're doing with the siding this year, because the cost of materials went up so much that they might, you know, there's a few buildings at Watson Farms. So maybe they would only oh, end up with okay. four out of five buildings. Okay. Um, okay. And for Kellogg Ave, you know, if the town, if the budget was reduced a fair amount, we'd um, maybe put more work on staff or, you know, maybe take out, you know, something. Um, so yeah, no, something. I just didn't know because if, if, if you were going by full totals and you had to fit fully fund it, all of them, then you were sort of just playing a numbers game, which came closer to the right. full grant amount, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, usually the committee would recommend, you know, their projects, and then we worry about the budget after and see how. Okay. Yeah. okay. I sort of had that same question as well. Um, and I, I'm sorry, can I ask one question too, Gail? Um, the non-social service projects, is there um, a number, a limit to how many we can fund? Uh, In the same way that there is with the social service? The state is saying three this year. So it's, it, you, sometimes we used to be able to fund more. Um, we funded four or maybe even five at times. I think so. They, I think they've always had the three rule in there. They've just been uh, pretty relaxed about it until this year, <laughs> which actually does make it harder because actually then that you know is asking applicants to actually have a pretty big project. You actually have to have a pretty big capital project then to round out your grant application. Whereas before, you know, communities could piece together different projects and add up to a grant amount, you know, grant total. And so I actually think the three, it can be pretty limiting. Um, well, I, I mean, it kind of makes our job pretty easy. We just take the, the, the top three recommendations, right? Right. I mean, essentially. <laughs> yeah, and then fully fund them. Right, but, but even if we pick the three most expensive ones, that still only gets us to 476 out of you know 536 right so then so, we can um we can then like we've done with social service we could figure out a way to prorate the budgets and maybe you know if there's three projects you can add um you know divide the remainder by three and just add that amount to each project you know as an equitable uh or some way to do it. The uh, typically we wouldn't. I do think that I agree. Nat, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think for instance, like what the Watson Farms Amherst Housing Authority they found with the siding project that we funded last year, the price of materials went up so much that the project cost almost doubled. And with this roofing project, they factored it in, but not incredibly. So it's <clears> like if by the time if the money is not available until next summer and the prices keep going up you know, the project costs may increase quite a bit. So, um, you know, I know they build in the contingencies, but they probably didn't build in, you know, a, a 50 or 60% contingency is probably 20%. And so what you just said now was, Nate, was that you, we would divide up the remaining funds from the three that we're going to fund and then give those to each entity. And so we're kind of overfunding them. That's, that's one way, um, you know, I think the committee could, uh, that's, that's one solution. And then we could always ask the applicants, you know, um, you know, is this, is, you know, is there a way to incorporate this money into the budget? Ask them to take more money. Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you could, you could prorate it based on the project cost and then have, you know, some. Um, I'm sure that'll be a tough conversation to have. Percentage. Yeah, very tough, very tough. I mean, I could. We're really only talking about twenty, not only, but it's twenty thousand dollars extra to each one if we fund the three most expensive. Right. So, in the grand scheme, I mean, if prices go up at all right. for either labor or materials, that'll be eaten up. Yeah. Pretty, fairly right. easily. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, what sort of the process like? Do we just say, "Great, let's do Kellogg, Hickory Ridge, and Housing Authority," and we vote? Well, if the, yeah, I mean, based on the chart, you know, so for the public that's in attendance, these are, um, you know, um, committee members rankings. Um, yeah, I mean, if the committee would, if that, if Becky, if you think that's what the, um, 
chart kind of shows are those three and the committee, you know, votes on it, then it's, it can be, it could be that easy. Um, if it's that clear, I mean, there might be one or two that may need to be discussed more. Uh, but. I mean, it looks like the Hickory Ridge was third, was fourth for three people. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, sometimes, I mean, I think for the committee, I think yeah, like you were saying the housing authority and Kellogg Ave, I, I mean, you said the housing authority, but maybe Kellogg Ave were two, um, yeah. two of the I, higher priorities. I, so. I ranked them and we got come in at uh, Watson Farms, Kellogg and then Hickory Ridge is one, two and three, as far mm -hmm. as the ranking that I, when I just plugged them all in as numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Are, this is such a confusing chart for me. I thought the left-hand column was the ranking, but but that's not there. You, you have to count across to figure out. Right, right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. They're, they're each they're, they're they're everybody's them. votes. Yeah. yeah. I understand. It's really hard to um, you know, sometimes there's a clear pattern, and I was trying to. Wait. It just says ranking. That was what was so through me. Yeah. Ranking yeah. one through five, but that's not. Not quite right. Okay. If you read across, then right, right. So you'll recognize one of those lists as yours, Rika. Yes, yeah. I I see that now. I just yeah, I, I didn't get that until we came into the meeting. That's funny, like, right? Oh, I guess okay. what you're thinking, right? I saw what you were thinking. Yeah, I had compared my rankings with with what I thought were the rankings on the left hand side, yeah, yeah. and now I realize, no, no, I totally misunderstood yeah. this. Yeah, no, I, I had the same when I opened it at first on my phone. I, I came into this thinking, and then when I sat down with this stuff, I, just, I then I noticed what there was an actual spreadsheet. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so actually, yeah, for me, I'm happy with the Watson Farms, Kellogg Avenue, and Hickory Ridge. Th those having yeah, that be our. I would three. move that we vote that we fund those three and divide the remaining sixty thousand among them. I would second that. Total. Yeah, that makes sense to me. The only yeah. the only question I have, and, and you know, maybe they're all the same, but in terms of dividing them three ways, is it um, is it possible that the pedestrian connections, the pathways and stuff might not be as subject to as much inflation as the other construction projects or are they all kind of pretty much you know, I don't know. the same i mean it, given that the i mean given that the watson farming uh, farms roofing thing is an ongoing and multi i would i would actually sort of almost be inclined to give the remainder to them um, just because i i prioritize roofs just personally um, but you know Yeah, I mean, that's a discussion for the committee. I think, you know, there's, um, I don't know if there, you know, there's probably a few different ways to, to do that. Well, when you had initially said pro-rate, I thought you meant pro-rate based on the budget they gave us as opposed to divvying it up evenly. I, well, I, I mean, I think I said both. You could do it, the, the, or you could write pro-rate it based on budget. Yeah. But. Right. Although then the Hickory Ridge is the biggest budget, so. Right. Although I don't know how we could theorize that maybe things haven't impacted them as much. I mean, I, yeah. I, I would have no idea. I feel the same way. Yeah. And the, I mean, in the end, their budgets are so similar. Yes. Or not is that, the budgets, but the, the total that they're They're asking. close, yeah. yeah. The it's request, def yeah. Definitely easier to just add 20,000 to each. Yeah. And we do have to keep in mind, and I know Nate has said this in the past, that all we're doing is we're making a recommendation and then you know the town manager can come back to us can change it so you know we can't i don't i don't think we have to spend too too much time splitting hairs because we don't really under know where the final numbers will end up anyway right yeah yeah okay so we so we do have a motion with a second on the on the floor so to speak yeah so Watson Farms, number one, Kellogg Ave, number two, and Hickory Ridge, number three, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, anybody opposed? Yeah, all in favor? Yeah. Aye. I'd like to do a roll call vote, Gail, just- um, okay. By name? By name, yeah. 
Okay, um, Lucas, how do you vote? Aye. Um, Nat? Affirmative. Becky? In favor. And Rika? In favor. And I'm in favor as well. And I think that's everybody on the screen and the committee. We got everybody. Okay, that was easy. Wait, so are we, um, you listed the, the um, each project, are we just adding 20,000 on each then? Nate, do you think we should do that or should, is, is it important to do that or where should we be on that? The, given the fact that there were leftover fund, extra funds kind of sitting there. I think, I think it'd be good for the committee to have, um, you know, a recommendation for the town manager, if it's, you know, we don't have to, I mean, if it's divided evenly or if you want to say prorate on budget and then we could staff can figure it out or, you know, or if you, you know, Lucas said, um, you know, that the roofing project is important and we don't want to, you know, so I think that's a discussion for the committee. What, you know, what's the way to do that? Well, what we just voted on was the 20,000 to each. So we can unvote that, but that's what, that was what the vote was. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine with that. I just was throwing out another idea. I, I just wanted to clarify. I wasn't sure. So if that's what the vote was, that's what I voted then. <laughs> I don't mean to, I'm not trying to stick anybody with that. I just wanted to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. Procedurally, that's where we're at. <laughs> so we're okay with a $20,000 overage going, being divided evenly between these three projects. Okay. The $60, yeah, the $60,000 overage. 20,000 per 20, project. Each. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Okay, any any other further discussion? Questions? No. Okay, on to the tougher work here. So we're moving on to the social service projects. And Nate, was your our, your plan, our plan to have people speak now and time it or where? Uh, for the hearing next uh, week. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, this is still the committee uh, committee's discussion. Um, so there are no folks that are going to get up and speak tonight. If there's questions, there are some members in the audience from the um, from the uh, proposals, but it's really you know they they can, you know if you know if you want to recognize them. But I think the um, it's really just you know the committee's chance to make the recommendations. Okay. All right, so um, on to the social service projects. Um, so as we see it, um, it's pretty obvious that Survival Center is the first choice. Uh, second feels kind of up for discussion, the way it looks, two for Amherst Community Connections, but no majority. Um, and do we and what's the number of these? that are the how many proposals do they accept in this category too? five five okay. so yeah, mm, we're very, yeah we're it's, so it's so it's up to five it doesn't have to be five um five you know but typically the town funds five and then you know the the trickier part then is the budget piece because you know uh, there's been more money requested than available. So, um, okay. I mean, but so I, I, I was kind of curious. You know, the, the, some of these are sort of all over the map. Um, there might be a project or proposal that gets a two and gets an eight. Yeah. Um, ranking. Um, so what I thought I would do is do an average and median and see where we come out. And it was interesting to me that the both average and median, there were four top um, yeah. rankings and there were three bottom rankings and number- And the three in the middle were, yeah. or two in the middle were really close. Close, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just took the numbers and and added them all up and then divide it by the number of, of and I came up with a, basically a scoring system and there's right in the middle, it just is really tight. 
And when I look at the, the chart we're look, in front of us, I see Amherst Survival Center and then Big Brothers would certainly be yeah. in the top three, and then I'll say. Reach, and then Amherst Community Connections, kind of, yes. And then, then it gets really tight around Literacy yeah. Project, Craig's Doors, and Center for New Americans. So now, what did you, when you ran the, your analysis, what did you have? Yeah, so, so the, um, the top four were pretty clear. Uh, Survival Center, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Family Outreach, and Community Connections. Yeah. And then Craig's Doors and Literacy Project were kind of pretty close. And then, um, so one was higher in median, one, the other one was higher in average. Uh, and then, um, Center for New Americans, the uh, CES food program, and the television one all were seven, eight, and nine for the, both average and for median. If we agreed to the top X number and we look at how much they requested and we I mean, I'm not sure what process we might use. So one possibility might be to look at the top one or two or two, I'll say, that seem pretty clear and allocate the funds and then see what remains and how we might want to split it among things that are so close. Do you want to say that again? Just explain that again. Yes. Yeah, so it seems so Amherst Survival Center and I'm going to say big brothers, big sisters, looking at this chart. I've not done the analysis, the numerical analysis, just looking at the chart. If we say, if, if we were to agree that those two we want to fund and we look at how much they've requested and we fund them in full, then we see what we have still to work with. I mean, that's just one idea of how to go from there. I mean, you're, you're almost, you're, you're really, I mean, you basically can top, fund the top three and then you're out of money. Yeah. Um, the okay. problem is, is, you know. Which we could it, decide I, to do. I mean, I don't. Right? I, like we could say we're just going to do three. Yeah, eventually. that's, that's yeah. It's true. So I wonder if we should just talk about the organizations and what people's thought processes were on making their determinations. Do you think we should do it for all of them? Or I guess I was suggesting since there's such unanimity among some, we didn't need to spend time on those, but. Yeah, we could agree on the top. I mean, it's really tight. Like, I don't know that we I need mean, to. I mean, I would, I would say we can agree with the type five and then start talking about it from there because um, the, the, you know, then at least we have four off the table. That's the way, that's the kind of the way we've done it in the past. And it sort of right. makes it easier to have. I mean, we've already, done our, our each individual scores. And I think it's easier when you kind of take it in a, in a grid fashion and just eliminate some to for, for the sake of kind of streamlining the discussion for what's more top heavy than what's more bottom heavy. Yeah. I mean, I would say that we're basically, I don't, somebody, this is my assumption, so please, um, that we're basically talking about the literacy project and Craig's doors is the number five slot. Well, so I'm going to just push back a little bit because I think that, and I'd like to hear what other people have to say, but I think each one of us, like obviously we made our choices for different, for our own reasons that we bring into this. And I guess I wanted, I mean, first just to say that obviously every single one of these organizations provides critical services and it's a shame that we have to even be choosing amongst them and they should all be fully funded and most of them should be unnecessary, right? If the world were a perfect place. Um, but obviously we're bringing our own life experience and work experience and volunteer experience and are living in the community to the choices that we made. Um, and I'm interested in knowing why somebody picked the literacy project as the first choice, right? I didn't yeah. put it up there anywhere near at the top. And so I'm curious, why did somebody do that? And I'm really would like to share with everybody why I put family outreach really toward the bottom. And it's not because they don't provide absolutely critical services. So I think that we all have value to to bring to each of this and i think that i before we start saying we're definitely not going to talk about this one i think we should talk about all of them i mean maybe we could don't have to talk about the survival center or 
Amherst Community Television, sort of those are, we can rock, put those out, but I, I think the other ones should all be fair game for a conversation. Okay. Okay. You want to I know that risks having an endless meeting, but I, I think it's really important. Well, how about if we set a time limit? <laughs> sure. Okay. So Becky, you can, you can jump in. Go ahead. Okay. So I, um, I went through and I, you know, I put, I'm sure, as we sure, I'm sure we all did, like in a way what this was, was sort of like making us decide what we think of as our own priorities. And it also made me really realize how important it would be to have other voices on this committee, people who have lived experience and, and maybe people who here have it, um, of having used some of these services. And, and um, you know, and, and I don't come from that. I come from having volunteered for a lot of them um, and given money to, to a lot of them. Um, but what I realized sort of the, where I, was focusing for me was on food, shelter, and children's mental health. Those are sort of the, the things that I think about most when I think about what yeah. I think we should fund. Um, and I also really paid a lot of attention to who's on the boards of these different organizations because I've done fundraising a lot. I lived in New York for a long time where most organizations are funded by their boards. And I look at an organization like Amherst Community Connections, where really the board members are people in the community who are not necessarily on that board because they're going to be able to donate money, but because they're bringing a value to it in some other capacity. I look at the Family Outreach Board and I see some of the wealthiest families in our community. And I think, okay, who has, if we don't fund these organizations, how else can they raise money? And Family Outreach does incredibly important work, but also has the ability to ask people to give more and has a really strong fundraising raising arm in really wealthy families and, and households in our community. So that's why I put them at the bottom and had nothing to do whatsoever with their work, but with their ability to probably raise $50,000 from the, their own higher income community that's there. Um, and so um, that, that was something that I thought about a lot as I was going through and looking at these organizations. Um, I, um, I also looked at Amherst Mobile Market, which is something that has, and I put that as my number five, um, because I am hearing so much sort of in the media and on just in people that I talk to about what an incredible difference that um, program is making in people's lives. And I think that the the grassrootsness of it, how community-based it is, that they pulled together the farming community, government aid, and community members to make fresh food available in a community where most of us, I think, take for granted that we can just pull over to a farm stand in our car on the way home from work and buy healthy food, but that's not possible for a lot of people. And yet we're surrounded by healthy, fresh food. Um, and it seemed to me that pulling together sort of that, that need for, for nutrition, along with the on entrepreneurship of giving people jobs in their communities and that it's a, an organization or a program that came that was based out of the community. The community asked for it and created it and created jobs for it and figured out a way to make it work and founded a farming partner. That to me was the kind of program that, that has a huge impact on physical and mental health and that is a sustaining business and changes how people eat. So to me, that was a, even though it's maybe, you know, it's another food organization, Amherst Survival Center also is obviously doing in a much broader scale for that. To me, that felt like a really important organization for us to fund. Um, so I will move on and let other people go because that was sort of my, my highs and my lows on my on my chart. But that was my mindset as I was divvying things up. Thanks, Becky. Does anybody have a question for her? That makes a lot of sense. I like the way you look at boards and I kind of look at them the same way yeah. as well and question a lot about the capacity of the board to do lots of things. So I'm on the same page as you. Um, yeah. Anybody want to dive in after Becky? Sure, I will. Um, I had kind of a different approach and I was kind of looking at all of the um, factors that we were scoring. So I didn't really make a ranking until I you know, put in all the numbers, one, two, three, four, and then um, you know, looked at it that way. So maybe a different process, but I guess one um, thing that I realized in doing it that way is that we have you know, nine you know, really good proposals here and some things might score higher on you know, community priority or you know, impact and other things might score really well on project description or you know, more kind of process oriented things. And also there are some um, organizations that in some ways overlap, as Becky mentioned, um, 
you know, with food and nutrition, you have the survival center, and then you also uh, have the, you know, kind of farmer's market thing. Um, or you might have Center for New Americans as well as Literacy Project that are kind of adult education. Uh, and then for the homeless uh, there too, um, there's both um, community connections as well as Craig's Doors that address that need. Uh, so, you know, I was a little bit, um, you know, when I actually did the, the rankings after filling in the one, two, three, four and adding them all up, um, you know, I wasn't sure whether that meant that if in my top five, there were kind of two food and nutrition, but there weren't um, the adult literacy, does that mean that, you know, we shouldn't give to that organization or, or vice versa, right? Um, so to me, I think it's, it's, you know, a valid question, you know, do we want to, um, you know, consider you know, the various needs and try to fund um, an organization that addresses each separate need, even if, or is it okay if we, um, you know, don't fund, you know, homelessness, so we don't fund, you know, adult literacy or adult education. So I think that's something that that we might want to consider, even if we're, you know, looking at the, you know, kind of top four and then trying to come up with what's number five or, um, but think overall in terms of, are we really getting the, the most out of the dollars that we have to allocate? Thanks, Nat. Anybody have a question for Nat? Okay. No, I think I will say though that, you know, Rico, you suggested just, you know, having the top few and then funding them fully, you know, in the past, the town likes to try to fund five activities. And so, you know, my thought would be, even if the committee wants to um, fund the top three or something to still provide, you know, at least the top five, because the town manager would want to see that. And, um, you know, I think it also then becomes a numbers game. I feel like, you know, I know costs, increase but in the last few years organizations are asking for more than say one fifth of the available budget and so you know sometimes uh you know if a, if an agency doesn't ask for a lot of money does it mean that it's uh not important or that you know they could fundraise that difference and it might not because of their capacity or the program and so um you know i you know i don't want to it's funny, like you don't want to set a precedent and maybe we wouldn't, but if we said, oh, let's just fund the top three at the full amount, would we see everyone start asking for a little bit more over the years just because if that's a trend? Um, so I, I don't disagree with it. I think, you know, the committee has discussed sometimes, how, do we fund five and what are, you know, like Nat said, do we fund five different um, priority, community priorities too? Do we try not to overlap? And I think, I think, you know, those are really difficult discussions. And so, you know, I like hearing that people use the ranking chart because it, it you know, I think if there's need out there, uh, then you could fund the same priority with two different activities. You know, the state doesn't, um, you know, we're, we're not disqualified from doing that. It's a local decision. You know, I, ironically, when the town wasn't a mini entitlement a few years ago, uh, the state said, oh, we funded you out of need, uh, kind of like as a kind of a joke. And I was like, <laughs> it was myself and some others from the town we were, I think they thought we were going to laugh a little bit and we all just kind of looked maybe stone-faced or shocked and they're like oh uh you know I guess that hasn't happened and we're like no <laughs> but sure in an ideal world maybe after you get 10 years of grant funding there wouldn't be a need but that's not the case right so we're not it's not like you know even if we build a permanent shelter we're still going to need uh services for homeless individuals and um so, was, you know, I, I think that, you know, in their proposals, if, if the agencies document the need, then it's there, right? So we don't, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not questioning that, but it is funny that the state kind of had that assumption at one point that, you know, we could fund ourselves out of, out of a need. And maybe we could, you know, at some certain instances, but. I, I, I can speak about my process a little bit, which was somewhat similar to, um, Nats, I, I found it very difficult. All the proposals 
are, are very compelling and, and demonstrate a lot of need. And what was interesting to me as I went through it and I ranked them, or I mean, so I read them and I scored them and, and there's, so there's sort of my gut feeling and then my rankings. And sometimes they don't exactly line up. So, you know, then I, I go back to the proposal and I look at um, project need. I, I, I rank that highly. I mean, interesting, the comment about, you know, looking at the boards, which I did. I don't, I don't maybe know quite as many people, so I, I don't have necessarily the same impression. But I would say that while I did rank the Amherst Survival Center very highly, I see that as an organization that gets incredible support from this community. And so... You know, to me, they have a lot of fundraising capacity and they've demonstrated that very effectively. And still I rank them high because I feel like the service they're providing is so important and I want the town to be supportive of that. Um, you know, I, I guess that's, that's what I would say about how the process I used. Well, I guess that's me then. Um, <clears throat> the process I used was um, simply what I see in the world. I see a, 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 the eviction man, uh, moratorium is going to are going to end. So I prioritized uh, housing. I think housing is uh, fundamental to stabilizing a life. Um, you know, I've, I've known and experienced a little bit of um, uncertainty there. I'll say that, and uh, that's one of the most dis, uh, disorienting things you can have happen in your life. Um, then I prioritized food and, and then over, I sort of overlaid on top of that, um, a, um, sort of a maintenance of the status quo in sense of people who, you know, the organizations that seem to be churning through the community and doing, um, continual pro uh, continuous processes or projects. Um, I sort of prioritized that and that was uh, basically what I did, but I, you know, I didn't look at the boards very closely. That is not something I'm, uh, that's not sort of in my purview from my personal experience. So thank you for that education. I will uh, pay more attention to that. Thanks, Lucas. Anybody have any questions for him? I, well, I guess I do a mixture of a lot of things. Um, you know, on the one hand, I would love to be able to spread the five um, activity, five grants the funding that we have over five different agencies but there's so much overlap i think that housing is really important um and homelessness and craig stores and amherst community connections getting people a boost because once you have housing then it's really easy not really easy but it's much easier to get work and to have a stable life um, but I'm also, a, I'm a big fan of the Literacy Project and Center for New Americans. They always have a lean budget. Um, they ask us, don't ask us for very much, and they really give people the grounding and what they need to get jobs and to speak the language and to be able to function in the world so that they can become self-sufficient. So I think I look at a lot of self-sufficiency. I also am always really drawn to big brothers and big sisters because I think that the work they do with youth is enormously important. So I kind of left, um, you know, I left the mobile market as my bottom, not that I don't believe it's as important, but I just felt that something had to kind of fall to the bottom of the list. And if that if, if fresh produce was something that went by the wayside, they could still get it at the survival center. So I'm a little bit all over the place, but I've always been a big fan of Literacy Project and um, Center for New Americans because I think it gives people exactly what they need to, to be on the road to self-sufficiency along with um, stable housing. So that's, that's what I've got to offer up. So the um, Laura Reisman from Family Outreach has her hand raised. Gail, if you want to call on her. The other thing, um, quickly before that is, so yeah, thanks everyone for sharing. I think, you know, I think the next discussion would be right. How do we go about ranking, or what what would be a consensus on, you know, if you want to do top bottom or, you know, start working our way to the middle. Um, sometimes we do that. There is, you know, um, we haven't had nine proposals in a few years, so it's it's a it's a lot. You know, so I think the most we've had at one point was twelve. Um, but usually it's, you know, not, we don't have quite as many as nine. So that is a lot of activities to fund. And, you know, I did preview this list with the state. They want, um, you know, for both social and non-social service, they ask many entitlement communities to 
uh, preview it with them. And I did, and I didn't hear back, um, which I think is a good thing, which means they haven't questioned the, um, you know, eligibility of the activity. So, you know, I sent them the description and, you know, if they were really concerned about something, I'm sure they would have in the past, they've, you know, had follow-up questions. So I think that we can feel comfortable, you know, with our recommendations. All right, um, Laura? Sure, yeah, Laura, I, I'll um, allow you to speak. You have to unmute yourself. Hi, hello? Hi. We yes. hear you. Yeah. Oh, yay, hello, hello. Uh, so I've obviously, since I was called out, I feel I need to address what Becky said. I hear what you are saying, Becky, and I understand that um, having uh, you know participants be on the board it, it is really wonderful and is um, when it comes to fundraising, that's the challenge. And that is the challenge, particularly if you are doing a lot of fundraising because you are very committed to having unencumbered num you know, funds. And that means when you apply for certain money and CDBG is one of them, you have to do a certain service. There's a service that that funder is expecting and you need to work within those parameters. And so when you have unencumbered funds, that means that you can do all sorts of things that other funders can't. Oh, you're not, you don't have a fa you know, family member who's 13 or under. You don't have this. You don't have that. When you have unencumbered funds, you can do whatever that family wants when they come in. And that has always been the philosophy of Family Outreach of Amherst. You call, you need help, we're going to help you. And so the more unencumbered funds we have, the more of that work we can we get United Way money to work on our immigrant um, services program. It's, they give us $7,000 a year. It's a much more expensive program and we fund it with unencumbered funds. And so that goes on and on. We have a, a contract with the Department of Children and Families. And what happens is they make us terminate that family when they are done. And so, if that family still needs help, and I guarantee you 90% of the time they do, we can help them because we have unencumbered funds. So when you look and you say, oh, they've got so much money. Oh, this board has so much money. That means we can serve that many more families. And so what I'm asking when I apply for um, a grant through CDBG is help us fund because it, it's more expensive than what we get, but help us fund this. So we can ensure that nobody loses their, in, their housing in Amherst, because if you do, you never will live in Amherst again because of the high rents. We work very closely with the landlords. We work very closely with um, the housing court. We are making sure Amherst residents don't lose their housing. And we get money very gladly from CDBG. But there's a lot more in that budget. And that comes from, shall we all say it together, unencumbered funds. And so I get it that you look at one struggling little program and you look at a program that feels very healthy and you think, well, why aren't we helping the program that's struggling? And what I would say to you is, First of all, I hope you support them as well, because of course they're doing good work. But the reality is that the healthier the program, the more people we can serve, the better we can serve. We have five caseworkers. They all speak Spanish. They are Im immigration specialists. They're housing specialists. They're parenting specialists. That's important. It's important to have that strong staff. And it's because we have the money to do it. So I, I get it why you were saying that, but I also think you have to look at it in a different way about what struggling families in Amherst need and what we're giving. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. And Laura, I just, I mean, just to be clear, and I think I made it clear, but just to be, I, I, there was no question that I think family outreach services are essential. Um, 
I was I was looking at it of like how you know who can raise money in other ways is what is essentially what I was thinking as I was looking through this. So, but I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Do you have a question? Any any other questions for Laura? Thank you, Laura. Thanks. So are we, where are we in our discussion? Do we want to go back to the top four that um, Nat determined with his calculations and, and discuss those? Or do you want to talk about the ones that fell off the list and see which one we want to boost up to that top four grouping? Anybody want to weigh in? You know, there are two more people raising their hands. I don't know if we want to. I can't, I can't see. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You know, Gail, you know, I, I guess I hadn't made you a co-host. Let me do that. And I think. Well, if you just I'm... click on participants, you can see them. Click on oh, participants good. and attendees, and you can see it's Lori Millman and Amherst Community Connections both have their hands raised. Yeah, I think, I mean, I would, I'd recommend it for now, maybe um, we can call on them in a minute. I would, I'd be curious to hear. Um, um, you know, if we can, if the committee has any, I was gonna, can you see this, the, the uh, Excel spreadsheet? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I was just trying to put together the, um, you know, at least the social services in a spreadsheet so we can start, you know, I can try uh, moving things around for everyone to see. If that's easy, um, and I, I don't know what you know. The uh, so the survival center was something that was mentioned, and then there's Big Brother, Big Sister, Family Outreach, Amherst Community Connections, Craig's Doors, Literacy Project, Center for New Market, uh, New Americans Mobile Market, and then Amherst Media. So I don't know if there's, you know, if people feel comfortable with having a, a one, two, or three now, or if there's. Yeah, I think this is helpful. So I guess this is what we've been saying a few times. If we if we have a pretty clear list of the top four and the bottom three between Craig's Doors and the Literacy Project, which one do we want to pull up to be the fifth? Well, it's if, I mean, yeah, I mean, to me, it seems like, you know, hearing Lucas and Nat that, you know, my thought is that I think, you know, all of these, this whole block right here, you know, there's set, uh, seven proposals here that are vying for four spots. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if there's been agreement that Survival Center is, rent, I mean, they were ranked pretty highly. So, you know, is that, you know, is, could we say that Surv Survival Center is one of the five and feel comfortable about that? And then discuss the remainder. I, I, raise your hand if you're in favor of Survival Center being number one. Or at least one of the five. All right. Okay. Got so that was for those in attendance, that was, you know, that, yeah. No, that was just kind of a straw poll. Yeah, just straw poll, yeah. Okay. And um, can we just go proceed down the list to sure. Big Big Sisters? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, the reason I have to just back up the reason we have the charts and we do the math is so we don't have to have endless discussion. So we have hard numbers in front of us. So I kind of like going to adhering to what's here because the math is true. So are we good with big brothers, big sisters being in the top five? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. And we're at family outreach as the third in the top five. Are we okay with that? As the scoring goes, okay, again, this is just straw poll. And then um, fourth would be Amherst Community Connections. And we're okay with that. Okay, I can't see Nat Larson because I only have X number of space on my screen. Hi, Nat. <laughs> and then, um, so that brings us to Craig's Doors and the Literacy Project, which seem to be um, fifth and sixth respectively. And then we've got Center for New Americans, the mobile market and Amherst Media. So I think at this point we can take Amherst Media off the table because it's very low on the scoring sheet. And that leaves us with Craig Storrs Literacy Project, 
um, and if we want to Center for New Americans in the mobile market. Um, we've got three people raising hands. So um, Nate, how do we feel about taking a break and letting people speak for like just a couple of minutes each at this point? Or do yeah, you want that sounds, to Yeah, that sounds fine. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so participants could limit their comments to, you know, like three minutes or less. That's great for the sake of time. Okay. It looks like, uh, Lori, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, you know, all of this is pretty challenging because you have tremendously valuable projects, <laughs> programs, and you have more programs that you can fund. Um, that, that, that are seeking funding and all do very valuable work and all collaborate and all serve some of the same people um, and a limited number of projects that you can fund. Um, and I guess I wanted to say two things. Um, there is an Amherst master plan which prioritizes, um, which I think sort of helps to govern um, how projects should be funded. And one of the values that the Amherst Master Plan champions is diversity in the population. And it specifically says that for the diversity that Amherst values to thrive, there need to be support services. And if you look at the um, demographics of the Amherst Public Schools, you can see that Amherst has a much higher percentage of immigrants in the public schools than many surrounding communities in the state at large and then the census data might suggest. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Gail's point that the Literacy Project and Center for New Americans provide a stepping stone for people on very limited budgets that give them access to all of these other services should be um, acknowledged, especially with all of the refugees and asylum seekers who have recently moved into town because when you support those folks, you're not only supporting the adults, you're supporting the children who rely on them. But um, given that you know, you, you, you're, you've know you got a very um, logical process here, and I just wanted to you know, remind you that, that you have prioritized adult education and that the town has prioritized diversity and the services that, that support that. And I guess I would say that if ultimately you decide that this is the way that you're going to go um, and they're all good programs, there is another um, opportunity for CDBG funds, I guess, in this year, because the scheduling is so um, unusual. And I wonder if you would at least consider supporting some of those programs that have gotten left out, because for us, this would be a significant hardship to lose this funding. This, this will have a significant impact on our funding. And we'll have to think twice about whether we can continue to pay rent on the buildings that we rent. Um, whether we can um, support the program at the current level. And um, that's challenging because we offer classes at multiple times of the day to help people who work all kinds of crazy overnight hotel shifts, all the jobs that no one else takes. So just to share that reality. Thanks, Lori. Does anybody have a question for Lori? Thank you, Lori. I really appreciated that comment about the diversity in the town plant master plan. I actually was not familiar with that. And I, I, me as well. I, I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, can I just pause for a minute? And I, I just want to throw out there to the committee that as we look down the list of activities, household state that we all agreed upon and we set as our priorities, household stabilization, support services for those experiencing homelessness, youth services, economic self-sufficiency, food and nutrition. That to me, and I think that we should try to fund, um, you know, one of each because it feels like we're sort of spreading the wealth, so to speak. So as we look at the top four where we are, we don't have um, an organization that is supporting economic self-sufficiency, adult education, job training in that top four. So as we look at number five, I would like to just have us all think about that for a moment. I, I agree with you, Gail, and that makes me want to fund either Center for New Americans or the Literacy Project as the fifth, personally, to, to address that particular issue. Thanks. All right. Um, just, with just, to, just to uh, remind us all, and if my memory is correct, that um, the last go around, we were not able to fund both, uh, but we did fund Center for New Americans, but not Literacy Project. 
Is that your recollection, Gail or Nate? I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, let's see, it's flip-flopped, but I think for last year, which is, you know, the 2020 CDBG grant, which we, re which we um, started this spring, it was Center for New Americans that was funded, right? Okay. And not the literacy project. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can we call on Judith to unmute herself and, you know, limit it to three minutes, please? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, um, first of all, I wanted to thank the town for considering our application and also for keeping social service organizations in the CDBG budget. Um, the Literacy Project adult students certainly use the other entities that you funded, the Amherst Survival Center, um, the Housing and Support for Homeless, and um, et cetera. And, um, we are the only program in Amherst that does um, adult education, the, um, what we always called the GED and now is also called the high set high school equivalency test in Amherst. Um, I mean, it's in mass, the whole state. Um, and I just want to um, encourage you to support adult education. Um, Center for New Americans is our partner um, once students are fluent in English, they often come to us um, for the, um, I keep calling it GED because I'm so old fashioned, but it, for the high set, high school equivalency and um, to move on with their lives. I think we all know that access to education is the road out of poverty and the road to self-sufficiency. Um, you know, all of us in this meeting, um, you on the board, are here because we've had access to education and are able to support our families well. And that's what we're striving for, providing for our adult students. They, we talk about community college and it's not just the two year community college degree, it's often the workforce training that the community colleges provide. Um, for our students and our students are mostly all working in the Amherst area, as Lori mentioned, they tend to work the overnight shifts and, and other jobs, but they want to move up and want to get ahead. And of course, as you know, in Amherst, we have a very diverse population in the adult ed programs. Um, the preponderance of students are students of color um, who are native born Americans along with immigrants and refugees who have learned English and then come to our program for the high school diploma. So um, our role is to give people hand up to support them to be able to move on and make a better life for themselves and their families by being able to earn a better living. So thank you. Thank you for um, considering the application and doing the good work that you are doing. I understand it's a difficult choice. Thanks. Thanks, Judith. Anybody have a question for her? Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Paulina, you may admit yourself and please try to limit it to about three minutes. Hi. Thank you, Thank you Gail. Um, my name is Paulina Adams. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a case manager at Craig Stores. Um, I am actually new to this whole process. Um, I jumped on working with Craig Stores um, in November of last year, and I have just seen my passion for the community grow so much. Um, and I want to thank everybody who is um, part of this process. Paulina for keeps cutting out for me. Oh, I keep cutting out? Are people able to hear her? I don't know if it's just me or if it's other people. I can I hear no, her, no problem. Oh, I have no okay. problem. Me, so keep going, it's my oh, computer. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to highlight the, um, the impact that I've seen as a case manager um, that's happening with case management at Craig Stores. So Craig Stores is a low barrier homeless shelter, which means that the folks that we serve are um, oftentimes the most acute members of our community. So the folks who have a incredibly high amount of need 
where they are not necessarily able to meet that need within any other area within our um, community. Oftentimes, these are folks who are turned away in a lot of spaces in society and aren't able to access people who are patient and willing to give them a second or third or sometimes a millionth chance um, to sit with them and to work on the things that they need help with. These are people who are coming to us with no ID, no nothing. Like they have literally nothing to their name and we are working with them to pick up the pieces and sometimes working with folks who have very limited um, like communication skills, whether it's because of disabilities or um, mental health or just an incredibly wide variety of needs that these folks have. And um, all of us that are working at Craig stores as case managers are folks who like, we are sitting with folks sometimes for hours on end to get one task done. And I don't mean one task as in like, we are applying to an apartment as one task. I mean like one task, like we are getting the document together for them to be able to fill out, to get their ID again or their social security card again. And that's the first step of them even being able to go get their application started for their housing. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you to wrap it up in the next minute, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Gail. Um, I'm just speaking a little bit about overall, like the needs of our folks are so high and oftentimes there are really limited services that will serve them because of how high their needs are, because we're a low barrier shelter and um, we encompass so many areas that um, oftentimes folks don't have access to. But I really appreciate everyone um, letting me speak and welcoming me to this process. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing, Paulina. Anybody have a question for her? Okay. All right, on to um, Caitlin Marquis. You can unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Gail, and thanks to the rest of the committee. Um, I really do not envy the position you're in. Um, this is a, an amazing slate of candidates for this grant funding. Um, and listening to all of my colleagues speak about the work that they're doing, it, it's just so moving. Um, so I, I, like I said, I don't envy where you are. Um, and I, I you know I just wanna mention every single one of these services that's on the docket here um, are, are used by, as far as I know, by the um, employees of the Amherst Mobile Market. And I just want to give a huge thanks to Becky for recognizing um, what is special about the Amherst Mobile Market program. Um, you know, I can't see exactly where the scoring came from, um, but I, I do think that what makes the Amherst Mobile Market stand out among these programs is actually the um, opportunities for economic empowerment, um, job readiness. You know, we um, submitted the application as a food and nutrition program. Um, it really makes a huge difference in that aspect. And we have seen as a result of the pandemic, just what a huge issue food insecurity is. I've been talking to the Amherst Survival Center and the Northampton Survival Center, and I just know what an influx of customers they've seen, um, or clients, excuse me, they've seen in the past um, year and a half. And, you know, I, I, I don't envy them either. It's a huge issue. Um, and yet, because we've done so much community engagement, because we've had really in-depth conversations with the communities, we know that those services are amazing and so useful to them and they don't go far enough. Um, and at the same time, you know, we are also, um, we are the folks who are employing the folks who are um, using the Literacy Project, using the Center for New Americans, using these programs um, that are positioning them to really succeed. So I think what the Amherst Mobile Market provides in this slate of um, candidates for funding really stands out among the rest. Um, I've heard this committee say you're interested in funding new projects, you're interested in racial justice and equity. I think that we um, really can help you meet those goals um, and I would love to see that happen. Um, but I just echo so many of the of the other um, folks who have spoken tonight and just saying that 
there's so much good work happening in Amherst. There's so many amazing organizations. Um, everybody's just really trying their hardest. It's been a really tough year and a half. Um, and, you know, I really thank you for your time and attention. I'll wrap up now, but um, thanks so much for considering us. Thank you, Caitlin. Anybody have a question for her? All right. I think uh, Amherst Community Connections is next, and I think they're the last one to speak, and then we'll go back to our um, deliberations. I'm gonna, the timer is running. Really? Hello, good evening. Ms. Gale, thank you so much for having me and the honorable committee members. I uh, want to just make a general comment about the process. Uh, year after year, you have so many wonderful, worthy organizations coming to you for funding. And I want to say, affirm the work of every single agency asking for funding here, even with the newest person or newest entity, Emirates Media, we all are here hoping that you will fund us. And I want to say that a little bit of funding, you know, for all of us will give us a boost of our morale. Money really helps, but the morale, it's also wonderful through the expression of money. And yet I understand you can only fund up to five projects. So for those of us, if who are so unfortunate not able to get funded, and the morale tend to dip a little bit and the money needed tend to be less a little bit. So I was wondering if the committee um, in your deliberation for the next round, which is coming very soon, will be willing to consider the idea that you had uh, raised earlier in the season about funding uh, certain categories say this year for food and shelter, next year for youth and literacy and diversity, something like that, that everybody will have a shot at it. And after all, the morale need to be raised and we are all worthy of your consideration. And the idea of maybe if you will be willing to consider another way doing it in addition to focus on different uh, categories of entity, maybe if you would also willing, be willing to consider, maybe if a, a agency, any agency has received funding, three or four or five, however numbers you want to say, consecutive fundings, then the agency, the entity itself will understand if there is a rule here that after say four consecutive fundings, you will be rotated off and let others to have the opportunity to shine so therefore you can bring in agencies such as the uh, mobile market, for example, to allow new ideas, new project to be expressed, to help with new project, to help with the racial justice issues that are raised by the mobile market. So that will be another way to consider to take care of the different needs expressed through these different agencies. And I just want to second, every one of us, nine entities here, we all do important work and we help people in different segments and they all have important needs to be met. Food is important, but adult education, but helping people who are new to this country to learn their skills is also important. And Amherst Media, the newest one, they are new. Why not give them a chance? So with this all said, I wanna thank you for trying so hard year after year. I remember 10 years ago when I first started the process, I think the Gail, you might remember me, I was the most unhappy camper. Every meeting I would come and I would complain, I'll write letters to you and you are so receptive to the proposals, suggestions I have made over the years. But I want to say every year, the committee is getting better, stronger, really representing the diverse views in this community. So with that, I want to give you as a chair of the CDBG committee a shout out for the wonderful work and the leadership you have demonstrated in this process. Thank and you so much. And your time is up, Wailing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to give you the one minute warning. Um, thank you, Wailing.
And um, we have Lev Ben Ezra, whose hand is raised. And you may unmute yourself, Lev, and try to keep it to about three minutes, three to four minutes, please. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me. And I echo all of my uh, colleagues and collaborators' sentiments uh, regarding the incredible value of all of these programs. Um, and I really appreciate the committee's deliberation. Um, I wanted to speak to just one particular component of that was certainly weighed heavily in the Amherst Survival Center's approach that we put forth in this proposal, and I imagine may also have weighed in um, some of the other organizations. And that is around kind of the true stabilizing capacity or potential of various services that have been offered. And um, I wanted to just speak actually somewhat anecdotal, but um, relatively soon after gaining my position at the MR Survival Center, and as I was researching food pantries and best practices and all sorts of information around emergency food provision, I was actually really stunned to find out about relatively low efficacy of many emergency food programs at alleviating food insecurity. And what it seemed like the research showed was that by providing a very small amount of food and not the types of food that people needed or wanted or what was what worked for their families, that many emergency food pr programs were providing enough food for people to survive, which is no doubt an incredibly important outcome in of itself, but we're not actually providing enough food that people became food secure and therefore could shift their resources and energies and emotional and mental bandwidth and time to focus on other aspects of their life. Um, so I just wanted to speak to that particular component as I hear the committee weighing in around um, all of these different priorities. I know that at previous meetings, many um, potential applicants spoke to the ways that all of these different things overlap. And I would just say that that's certainly true for the Amherst Survival Center, that while we're absolutely and very firmly um, applying under the food and nutrition component, that that's really a core goal that we've set forth with this CDBG proposal is to increase the food provided really to the level that we are providing for food security for those 2000 Amherst residents, um, 2000 or more Amherst residents that would be served. And that to me feels like a really incredible commitment in terms of the stability of those families and their ability to participate in many other aspects of their civic life. Um, so I really, really appreciate uh, all of the different comments spoken around the variety of these services that are required to support families and really stabilizing and moving to their next step. We're hearing about adult education needs and the family support needs and all of these other programs and youth development needs, which are also things that we all refer families to as well as shelter. Um, so I'm very appreciative of uh, that collaborative nature, but I just wanted to speak to that component um, because I heard a couple committee members kind of weighing the household stabilization and that when we look at that of what can actually happen from sustained funding year after year in terms of supporting the expansion of programs and moving forward and really providing uh, a more complete picture of what families need can be really powerful. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate all of your efforts as volunteers on this committee. Thank you, thank you Lev. Does anybody have a question for her? Okay, I think those are all the raised hands that I see in the moment. So. Here we are um, back with trying to figure out um, if we're still all in agreement on the top four, uh, what should be number five. So do you, anybody, does anybody wanna jump in and make a recommendation for number five? And I appreciate everybody's comments. And I think that when we set priorities going around for the next year to have a discussion about funding organizations uh, for subsequent years and how that would weigh in with new organizations. All right, so. I guess I would um, like to follow up um, Gail's comment earlier about um, the literacy project and being able to fund the adult education self-sufficiency um, goal through one of the five. And so I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, but I'm wondering if anyone else wants to make the case 
for instead of literacy project, um, Craig's doors. Is anyone interested in taking that advocacy? I don't know that I'm ready to advocate for anything just yet. I think each person who just spoke um, persuaded me of that everything they were saying was exactly right and that's what we should fund in the moment that they were speaking because each it's all correct and I agree with all of it even though some of it you can't agree with both but I do um I think that you know I um seek the work that Craig's doors does as literally keeping people alive um in a way that um isn't obviously what the focus is of the adult education programs, right? And so I, I am in no way weighing anything right here. It's just sort of looking at, you know, when I think of what Craig's Doors does, it's literally taking people who could go nowhere else and with no barriers whatsoever, giving them a place to sleep and food to eat. And, um, you know, I spend my day in court as a prosecutor and see people at their very, very worst. And um, knowing that there are programs out there helping people like that, um, is, I mean, it's, it's just such an essential part of, of a community. Um, so it's, I agree with the concept of supporting adult education and that we should support, you know, I like the idea of having one of each category in our top five, but it's hard for me to, to say that we wouldn't support Craig's doors. And again, I'm not really advocating one or the other. I'm just sharing that that's kind of where I'm at. I understand it's it's this is this is hard and we we share from our heart and we share from our heads so and that's the hard part. Anybody else have a comment about uh, potential for number five? Okay, so I just want to um, sorry I just want to make sure I understand. So are we saying that or is there agreement that the survival center, big brother, big sister, family outreach, and Amherst community connections are four out of five? Or I I wasn't sure that we were there yet. Um, we we were prior to everybody speaking. We kind of were, but yeah. yeah. With a straw poll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, the pro it's just it's it is really challenging to to think about omitting anything from here. Um, but I feel like we we I am willing to stay with the straw poll as it. Um, reflected those top four. All right, so where do we go? I mean, if we want to fund five, I guess that's the question we're trying to get to. Right. And I think, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what Becky has just said, but I feel if we um, fund Craig's Doors, that Family Outreach, Amherst Community Connections, and Craig's Doors are all organizations that support household stabilization. And I feel like, you know, we need to address the other priorities that we created or listed. So I'm torn. I mean, I think another thought that I have is, is kind of what Lucas was talking about earlier about, um, housing right now and the eviction moratorium coming to an end and, and the fact that in this moment housing, I mean housing has always been an issue but it, it has sort of a, a particular um, focus right now I think on or the, or the, the fact that so many people are becoming um, homeless and struggling in a way that maybe in the past, I, I guess it's just numbers seem, seem bigger now I guess just sort of as a sort of a comment that it would make sense, I think, in this moment, given what we're living through, for uh, there to be a stronger focus on housing. Good point. Uh, anybody have any other comments? Do you want to take a vote on Craig Stores versus the Literacy Project? Maybe that's the way to do it. I just want to. I just want to ask: Is my screen? Is that screen still visible? The spreadsheet? Is that still? Yes. 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 Yes, and very helpful. So can we just say in the moment, Rika, if you had to make a recommendation between Craig's Doors and Literacy Project, and I'm just picking on you because you're top of the screen, 
um, which you would choose. Um, I would choose the literacy project. Okay, um, Matt. Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's really hard choice because I think that you know the way Becky framed it is that yes, the need for housing and keeping people um, off the streets and you know safe inside does seem maybe more important than education, but um, because we do have the family outreach and community connections, you know, really supporting that um, need also, I guess I would be inclined to, you know, support the, you know, the immigrant, the newly arrived, um, the vulnerable in that sense and try to, you know, help, help them and um, both Center for New Americans and Literacy Project you know, do that really, really well. But if we only have room for one of them, since we did um, support Center for New Americans last time, I would be inclined to support Literacy Project this time. Thanks, Nat. Um, Lucas? I, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty torn on that one. Um, I, I think I'm gonna be swayed by the, the panel and say Literacy Project, um, just, just because we do have to things for housing. Um, I will say that I, d I don't know, but the timing next spring, I think is going to be that uh, that's when, because the moratorium is gonna have to end. And I think that's probably what they're looking at. I don't think they're gonna end it through uh, the, the winter, but so the timing would be right. But uh, you know, there is already support for that in the community. And I think keeping it a little bit balanced even through this is probably important. It's important. So I'm gonna go with literacy project. Thanks. Um, Becky, I know, think I know where your vote. Which no, way? I don't know. I really, that I was saying, I was not really advocating. I was really just describing. Okay. I, um, I don't know what my vote is, but obviously I will choose. <laughs> so I, um, I think that, and I guess actually it doesn't even matter, right? Because there's already a majority vote. I don't even have to cast a vote. There you go. Okay. I'm undecided. <laughs> All right. It was, it was over before I voted, to be fair. Wait, has Gail, sure. has Gail said anything? <laughs> Wait, yeah. I actually think I think Gail's Becky. I, I'm not budget, comfortable right. with Becky abstaining. No, I was It's a <laughs> difficult choice for all of us. I know. I wasn't yeah. actually going to abstain. Okay, think, thank um, you. Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't. That would not be. <laughs> that wouldn't be yeah. fair. No, it's um, that's tough, man. Um, but I actually think that um, I would go for the literacy project too. I think it's important to support a lot of different kinds of organizations. Okay. All right, and since I advocated for them to begin with, you know where my vote lies, so. Is it inappropriate to recommend people that, you know, make sure that they just, any overflow, they send it the other way for the housing stuff, you know, from Craig's doors, if they have overflow, that they can try to reach out to the other community uh, projects and housing. Is that, you know, it's ridiculous for me to say that, right? But You can't even fund any of them in their entirety. Well, you know, you could maybe for the meager ones, you know, like literacy project is 20, but anyway, we're not there yet to the numbers. So, okay, are we good? I'm going to make a motion that we fund the survival center, big brothers, um, a sub survival center, literacy project, big brothers, big sisters, family outreach and Amherst community connections. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye, any, any, po any opposition? Okay, we're all good to go. We had a ton of discussion, so. So um, should we should we talk about the numbers then for each? Yeah, so we're good. Everybody's good with that. And I really appreciate the input from all the representatives from the organizations tonight. This is never, never easy. And I have to say that we've never done it, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's even harder when you're in person and you have to see everybody's faces and the supporters from each organization. So yes, we can Zoom from our homes and it, it makes it, smidgen easier. So now we get to the numbers part. So we have 165 available to fund out of the overall amount once we've taken out the amount for the, the capital projects, the non-social service. And so we've got to take, thank you for doing the math here. Um, yeah. 
Nate. So we've got um, 60,000 more in asks than we can actually fund. So in the past, um, and Nat, remember, if you just want to refresh my memory, how we've done this, we've done like a proportion of each ask relative to the overall amount. Is that how we've done it in the path? You're the mathematician in the crowd. Well, yeah, we've we've done it in in different ways. Um, and so you know, I don't know that there's anything that that would really bind us in terms of how we would look at these. I was just going through these numbers and just maybe it would help if I I'm happy to start out and throw out a recommendation and other people can attack it or discuss it or or agree with it. Um, but so just for example, um, survival center, I penciled in 60, which is 86% of what they asked for literacy project uh, 15, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Wait a minute, and what percent, and that's what? Three quarters, okay, I guess, 75%? Yeah, that, 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 75%, right? Yeah, okay. And then Big Brothers, Big Sisters, I penciled in 27, which is 68%. Sorry, my, this, is, <laughs> this is formatted as a 20 as Big Brothers. Right, and then for Family Outreach, I penciled in 33, which is 66%. Sorry, what was family outreach? I missed that. Uh, 33. Uh, and community connections, I penciled in 30, which is 67%. And that gets us the full tally to one. Gets us to one. 65, I think. What was family and outreach percentage? Family outreach was also 66%. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's kind of rough numbers, but but when I was penciling them in, I thought, well, Survival Center was clearly kind of the, the consensus top choice. 86% um, of their ask seems like a you know pretty fair amount. They can do a lot with that. Um, Literacy project, even though it was like number five for us, their ask is pretty small. So 15,000 out of 20,000. And then the rest kind of between 66 and 68. And there's not really that much difference there, but um, kind of dividing up what was remaining. Thank you for doing the math. I think we're all just kind of mulling the numbers over before we comment, correct? Yes. Seems like a fair approach. Right, I mean, I think the, the amount over is so much that it's like you could almost, you know, it's almost like you would eliminate two activities if you funded that a few at their asking um, budget. So it is difficult to whittle down the budget. Yeah. I know that every budget is, I mean, all of them are doing so much with every dollar that they get. I guess, um, I wonder how much, I mean, the idea of funding somebody, funding the, or an organization for all that it's asking for and not sort of having any of its work be to make up any of the funding, um, whether it's worth thinking about doing that for a couple of them that seem particularly bare bones and then giving less to others. I don't, I've, have you ever done it that way? And just thought, okay, Literacy Project is asking for $20,000. And if they don't get that five, what does that actually look like? Does that mean that they can't have an, is that a whole class that they can't host, you know, or, or teach? Um, and so I was actually trying to just pull up budgets to see where the, the money is supposed to be going toward. I think that's, that's a good question. Becky, a few years ago, um, when the town had a reduced uh, grant award, I think you know we could we didn't we couldn't we weren't eligible to apply for a twenty five, and so we asked, you know, uh, this was a number of years ago. Like, what was the minimum? And you know, say for instance, if a if an organization is asking for a position, 
you know, say 50,000 funds, a three quarter position or a full time position, if you get, you know, 66%, then, then that's actually, you know, like a two thirds position, right? So it's like it, you know, there's a, there could be a prorated um, level of service that would be offered depending on the funding. And so I don't, you know, we, you know, staff, we make that adjustment internally. So if, for instance, we're, you know, if um, the literacy project, we, re we keep with these, um, you know, Nat's suggestion and they're like, oh, well, that might mean, right, we do have to reduce our programs a little bit. When we would apply to the state, we would adjust the expected beneficiaries if they said, okay, you know, we've lost the ability for something. So we, you know, uh, staff works internally with the recommendations and the organizations to, you know, adapt the application as necessary. So it's a good consideration. I will say that, you know, if it, for instance, if some organizations like we, you know, we can't take it or it makes it really difficult, um, you know, the next step in the process is, um, you know, this is a public meeting, but then this gets publicized and there's a public hearing next week and we can hear, you know, comments and the town manager would have previewed this. And then um, if there's any uh, compelling reason to make a change or adjustments and that could happen after the hearing as well. So there is the ability to, to make that if, you know, if someone says, wow, this makes it really difficult or right there, a program, you know, if that 5,000, for instance, meant that a program just couldn't happen at all, then, then we, you know, we could hear about it. Can I, um, thank you, um, Nate. I feel a little sense of discomfort with the Survival Center. And I know that the magnitude of their project and the numbers that they serve is so much greater than the others. That's why they ask for more money, but to fund them 86 when you've got, and I've always said this at Literacy Project and Center for New Americans ask for so little, their budgets are lean. Um, I also feel that um, you know, big brothers and big sisters are the only organization that are serving youth that we've selected. So I just feel like I personally would like to see um, Survival Center just scale down so there's more of an even spread, maybe at 75%, and then to take those remaining funds and see if we could boost big brothers, big sisters a little bit. Um, and um, also maybe family outreach and literacy project. Yeah, I tend to agree with Gail. I feel um, I, I don't see the need to give 86% of the survival center's budget. I, I'd like to see a little more even split. And yeah, yeah I, would, I would land there as well. I think the average is 73.33% if you do just, that's how much of the budget that's asked for that we have. So if, if it's there, if that's what that we come at that to that amount, that would give the survival center 51,000. That gives us an extra yeah. nine to play with um, out of their percentage. So we could reallocate that, you know, that nine other places. Yeah. I, I, I personally tend to like the just evenness of, you know, set amounts. I, but I, you know, as a junior member here, I, I uh, no one's a junior member. We all get an equal say, <laughs> um, you know, there's something to be said for experience. Um, so yeah, you know, Lucas, just, I, yeah, I just did that quickly, you know, a 73% allocation, right. Of the ask, you know, gets pretty close, right. To the 165. That's what you had said. Yeah. That to me, that feels more comfortable and more yeah. equitable. I mean, are there, has there ever been a consideration of um, sort of doing a, a maximum amount that you can ask for um, in the sense of like, if there's a, you know, in comparison to the budget that's projected, I know that's, you know, the timeline on that is messed up, but I just, if there's any way to dissuade people from just asking for, you know, I, I don't think that's actually happening, but, you know, yeah, no, that, no, um, that's a good question though. We haven't, um, you know, when Craig's Doors first started over 10 years ago uh, with block grant money, we funded them quite, you know, um, more than um, any amount that's asked now this year. So uh, I think that, you know, uh, has been suggested there's probably different ways the committee can develop the process for proposals. There could be a minimum and maximum. There could be, 
uh, funding priorities, limiting the number of activities. And so, you know, some communities might put more of their budget toward the non-social services and not fund the social services as much. I think, so I think there's probably a number of different ways that can be done. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's difficult when you have to parse the budget, right? The numbers, um, but we don't, you know, unless the committee wants to have some clear guidance, you know, at the beginning of the application round, you know, it could happen next year, for instance, right. um, but not, you know, it, you know, some of it is, you know, I think the difficulty of doing that is we don't know what could be, what, what might happen or what might come in, right? So what if there is an agency that just needs a certain amount and there's a really critical need and maybe the committee, help, you know, funds that at a certain amount or, you know, I, but right. Yeah. I, that was purely academic. No, it was oh yeah, no, no, I know. It's a, no, it's a good question though. Um, you know, and I, and, and Lucas, the organizations who are applying do understand that we can only fund five and that we have limited funds. We only, yeah. you know, it's 165. Right. And um, they know that, you know, as, as Nate always says, some communities just fund three organizations and fund them fully. And we try, we tend not to do that just because out of nine, it would feel even harder to pick three. So um, the organizations applying are aware of the limited funds yeah. and the fact that they're only five, we can select five. Yeah, I hear you. So how are, how are we doing on this, um, this new revised formula? I, I, I like the option number two. I, I like the, I, I would vote for that one over the first choice. Should we go Goldilocks though and do an option number three, whether there's <laughs> too hot, too cold, and this right? <laughs> whether there's just what? I, right. And option number three, where there's what, Nate? I, I was just saying, you know, like with Goldilocks, right? There's a okay. three. Uh, okay. No, I mean, if we, if this, if the committee likes the option two, I don't, you know, there's, that's one way to do it, you know, they, in terms of, uh, you know, from the town's perspective, it you know it makes it's a it's a rational approach to to the budget. But right, and, and I have I have no, you know, I mean, I proposed option one, and I might favor that over option two. But I'm happy to be in the minority and have option two passed. I think, you know, both are, you know, valid approaches, and there's no one right way. We're not going to be able to satisfy. You know the needs for all five, much less the worthy ones that we didn't even include in the top five. But yeah. um, I think I think um, if the majority wants to go with option two, I would not object strenuously. Well, one of the reasons um, I I would prefer two um, is simply that I only put Amherst uh, Survival Center as as my, as my first pick because I felt like that was food security done. You know um, that that was sort of check that box for me. And then I went on to, you know, well, what do I, who do I think is going to do serve, serve the community better in, in these other categories, you know? And so I, to weigh them higher kind of puts what I did on, on the cheat, on the sheet a little bit out of context. So, but. Um, do we have, want to have any more discussion over our option two or is there an option three, <laughs> three, go Goldilocks uh, as Nate uh, says. Yes. I just wanted to complicate things. I, I, Thank I'm you. Not, I'm not. Thank you. Um, so it's 8.42 where you are. It's 9.42 where I am. So for the sake of time. Oh, wow. um, Central Canada, good for you. I, I am. Um, I would love to see if we could uh, have take a vote on the recommendations that are labeled option two. Um, if anybody want to discuss any further? No? I, well, I guess. Um, Option two doesn't come fully to 165. Right. Do you, do you want to, if you if you I round the literacy project personally, it's right. if you if you round them to 51, 15, 29, 37, and 33, then it comes out to an even 165. Okay. I think. Or that... or what Lucas suggested, we just put uh, 750. With the literacy project, that I would yes, I I like uh, Lucas's recommendation. Well, just everybody, I don't know this, but the experience on the on the panel seems to say that they are a very trim budget, so that's why I said that. Well, I know it's kind of ironic actually, because I was just trying to sort of figure this out. Like when Gail was saying, 
that 86 felt like too much for percentage wise for the survival center to get because we have these other much leaner budgets. And then in the recalculation, the literacy project ended up with less. Not yeah. significantly less, right, but they ended up with less than they had the first time around. And I guess there's, I don't know, there's no fair way to do it. I guess there's like a piece of me that for no particular reason thinks that we should fully fund the literacy project and Big Brothers Big Sisters because they both seem like they're such lean budgets and are paying for staff that, you know, makes such a difference with each person that they're working with. Um, but I think that's probably the same for all of them. Is that is that option three? <laughs> that's that's option three. That's the default one. <laughs> Super excited for an option right. three. Right, but wait, do we have enough money to do that? I, I have another option after three. I can go four if, you know. No, I mean, well, the, so the way we, to do that would just be then you divide up the rest. Like if we said, okay, we're going to fund fully um, literacy oh, project okay. for Brothers Big Sisters and then take the remaining, what, 105,000. And divvy it yeah. up. And divvy it up. We could look at those numbers. Somebody want to play them out in, a, in the next column? Right, let me just um, do that. I'm not, I'm not a wizard, except you're, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have that math mind. Sorry, I'm, I, I can uh, just do that. What were we were saying? The literacy project at 20, right? And oh, big brother, big sister at, um, at 40. 40. Yeah, let me just format that. But here we go, you know, if we fund those two at 100% and we just felt, and I just voiced that I felt uncomfortable <laughs> in survival center at 86 and everybody at lower amounts, how do we reconcile yeah. this? Yeah, so that, that would just be what, 33, you know. There's an evenness to option two that is hard to get away from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rationale for option two feels very comfortable. Yeah, that's gonna be short a little bit, but. Um... Yeah. Wait a minute, it's, why isn't it, isn't it 35,000 each? Oh, sorry, yeah. I was just doing quickly. Uh... Yeah, I mean, the workup I had was uh, everybody got, uh, it was roughly, it was very close to that, but the extra five went to the survival center instead. Uh -huh. That's sort of what I had had in my notes. I think I like option two better. Yeah. Again, it feels more equitable. Option two is just sort of easier to, you know, feel the objectivity in. Yeah. And, I, and even though I like op option two, I just want to mention the only thing that gives me a little bit of doubt is that because it's all basically the same percentage of the ask, it does kind of reward yes. any agency that's, that's, you know, kind of asking for a larger amount. Um, but but I do like the objectivity of option two. I agree with Matt. Yeah. I I do you want a motion, Gail, on option two or uh, do you want to make it, Rico? Sure. I'd be happy sure. to make that we um, vote on approve option two as our funding recommendation. As our budget al allocation. Okay. Anybody second? I'll second. Any, and we've discussed any dis no further discussion. All right, shall we vote? Raise your hand. Oh, we have to do the yes. roll call vote. Okay. Yeah. All right, Rika, how do you vote on option number two? In favor. Okay. Nat. In favor. Lucas. In favor. Uh, Becky. I I didn't hear you, Becky. In favor. Oh, okay. Okay, and I'm in favor as well. So I think we have uh, our majority mm -hmm. and roll call and uh, for funding recommendation option two to go to the town manager. All right. Okay. Well done, everybody. So yeah, it looks like the, um, you know, all the, the non-social service activities have to be within a target area and they were, right? So they were funded within the town center and the um, Hickory Ridge or the East Hadley Road, um, Pomeroy Village Center. So that's that's good. <laughs> you know, for instance, if the Munson Library was recommended, it's just outside the Pomeroy Village Village Center. So then we'd have to recommend adjusting those boundaries. So we don't need to do that. Okay. Um, 
I was just going to share the agenda again, just so I think we've, um, you know, I guess it would just be any outstanding public comment or other items. I think we've covered the, the majority of the meeting. Can I ask next, at next week's meeting, which is at the hearing, is that right. for, I mean, we've now given our recommendation to, or we will have obviously after tonight to the town manager. So is that a hearing for him to hear? No. That where we could change the recommendation we've made. Yeah, so the um, the state requires that the a municipality hold a public hearing to allow comment on the recommended activities to, uh, that would be included in a town's application. And so um, I don't wanna say it's perfunctory, but you know, I think the committee, we, you know, I, some communities I don't think go through this process where we have an RFP and we do a, a pretty, I, I think it's a pretty robust review and questions and then recommendations. And so the hearing is a chance for the town manager, if, you know, if the town manager's office wanted to change the recommendations, they might before the hearing, but they might also then wait and see if there's any, you know, anything, any significant comments that come in. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's, you know, they, in the past, the town managers felt comfortable um, making changes before the hearing, and sometimes they make it after. And so, I think, um, you know, I think the current town manager um, knows the process is, uh, you know, I think is done well. So they don't, you know, they, you know, they understand the process and how the committee makes recommendations. So, so really, the public hearing is for the public. You know, for people who've submitted proposals and for any other comments to come in. You know the public manager will be notified tomorrow the recommendations and and sometimes might want to meet with gail before the hearing i think we've done that in the past just to discuss the process and deliberations that from this meeting but okay yeah so like i said i think we don't do any deliberation sorry so we, don't, we don't as a committee do any deliberation then well, the, the way the agenda is posted is, you know, we receive public comment and then, then uh, afterward, there's a chance for the committee to deliberate again if there's, you know, if there's some reason to, right? So it's, it's you know, there's that um, agenda item or that, you know, ca you know um, ability to do that. But we don't have much time. <laughs> so if, if after the hearing next week, you know, we'd, I'd want another vote just to finalize everything. So that gives us about two weeks to, um, to get the application done, which is with Ben's help, that's sufficient, but it does take about two to three weeks to put the application together. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, for instance, um, you know, there were some, like you said, there was some a discussion around some of the social services and, you know, the town manager may have you know, what if the town manager thinks, oh, maybe there should be one that's funded that isn't or something, maybe would wait to hear the comments from the hearing to see if maybe there's a switch that would happen, for instance, right? Like if that was the case, or, you know, if there's really, if the committee was really on, uh, on uh, kind of undecided about a capital project, maybe they would wait. Uh, but. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else we need to talk about? No, I think I was going to let you know that, um, you know, our, we have, you know, the 17, 18 and 19 grants are done and we're working to close them out administratively with the state. The 20 grant is um, underway and the two capital projects, the town's Mill Lane project and then the Housing Authority Watson Farms is, is behind schedule. You know, the Watson Farms one was delayed because of the uh, high cost of material and the, you know, the price escalation. And so they've been working with their architect to try to figure out how to complete the project, uh, the scope of the work and, um, you know, within the budget. So that, I know that's been difficult for them. In the Mill Lane um, project, we're hoping to get that going this fall, either started in the fall or ready for the spring. Um, we do, you know, it does have, both of those projects need to be done by next, you know, next June. Um, so, and then, you know, the state typically has requirements that you have to spend 80% of your, you know, the previous grant by the time you apply, but this year, because of the staggered schedule, they don't have those same requirements. But I think when we apply for the 22 grant, you know, they'll have to have, they'll have some requirements in terms of project expenditures or contracts. And so, you know, if we're behind, they'll, 
they could reduce the award we can apply for. So, you know, that's a that's just a requirement they have. And this year we're fine with it. But I think next year, depending on what time the 22 grant is due, you know, if our 20 projects are still delayed, we'll we could be in a little trouble. Um, thank you for that. I remember we at a, at a former meeting we talked about something going on with East Hadley Road, and there was money that hadn't been spent. That's like in the back of my brain. Is that my? Do you remember that? Yeah, I think um, the East Hadley Road project came in um, under budget. That's the 2019 grant in the in our in our um, the DHCD's one year action plan and the town's plan. The process is to then. Um, the first priority is to put money in the existing activities and the second one is into housing. So um, Valley CDC had been awarded money for their um, affordable housing project. And I forget the amount, it might've been like 19,000 we allocated to Valley CDC's project um, because it met those two um, pieces of the action plan and our, our grant management plan. So if it was something, if it was something different, if we didn't have that activity uh, as part of our grant, we would have to have maybe, you know, held another pro, you know, another a, um, a public hearing to reallocate it. But given the time, we only had a few months left in the grant and that activity met those two priorities. We just, you know, we allocated the money for that. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Okay, do we need um, any other comments from anybody? So so I'd, like to thank, I'd like to thank everyone too, the committee and the public. I think that, you know, Every year, it's a difficult process to review proposals and make decisions. And you know, I know you're volunteers, so thank you. Everybody, it was a very thank thoughtful you. discussion as always. And I love that we all bring different viewpoints and but then we can come together in the end um, to do good work and make proposals that we feel reflect um, the work that we've done. So we're meeting next Thursday at seven on Zoom. Um, with a public meeting and we will be um, listening to folks and we will try to kind of clump them together um, so that we aren't hearing from representatives from the same organizations six times consecutively. So what we've done in the past is we've done just sort of like a run through, um, going through the first, you know, have a one run through of everybody representing an organization, let them speak, and then we can go to the top again um, if time allows and limit people's um, speaking time to three, three to four minutes felt like people managed to fit that in tonight. Yeah, I think three minutes is pretty comfortable. You can say a lot, actually. <laughs> as long as we have the timekeeper on, uh, on, you know, on duty. All right, do we need a motion to adjourn because this is uh, being recorded? Sure, why not? I'll move like move to adjourn. Okay, so any second? I'll second, I'll second. Thanks. All in favor? Do we need to do a roll call for that, Nate? No, I guess we can. <laughs> <forego that. laughs> okay. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, everyone. Thank All you. right, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Have a good week. Enjoy